Shalom, my name is Madeline Novick, and I would like to take time to thank all our soldiers who fought so hard to give me the freedom of speech to speak to you today. Not many of my relatives survived the Holocaust in Europe, and, I, and once again, we must preserve the freedoms that are silently slipping away. As Passover was our deliverance from slavery, I would like to give you the application and freedoms from bondage hidden in the Feast of Israel for every soul living. <coughs> uh, I was once asked by the U.S. Congress to deliver a speech I wrote for the Urban League on, employ on improving services for the minority aged. And now I have the privilege of speaking to you on public broadcasting. Currently, I am CNA in therapeutic recreation. And previously, I was a state rep for C Concerned Women of America. With that said, uh, we shall begin. The following is going to be an exciting teaching by Benny Hinn, the f and uh, that may change your life. This was said by a wise teacher, King Solomon, Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out the matter. God's glory is concealed in his word, but the believer as a king and priest can see his glory revealed by searching out the matter. It's time you and I began to search out the matter so you can see the glory of God. God's word is a mine of treasures that must be searched out but cannot be found out by mere surface reading. You can no longer find things out by just surface reading. It must be brought to the surface. It must be dug out. And that is what happens when we study the word of God. And that is why I told you earlier, you must study the word of God in the last days. Much will be revealed to you that, and as you study the Feast of Israel, priceless gems will be found out. It is impossible to understand the New Testament without the Old. And conversely, it is impossible to understand the Old Testament without the New, because the New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is incomplete without the new. In the new, the old is concealed, and in the old, the new is revealed. You have to have them both. It is work. The word is eternal. God cannot change his word. Why study the feast? Because the feast reveal prophetic re seasons in not only your life, but first in the life of the Lord himself. But secondly, what happens in the church? And thirdly, your life. I think you and I need to grow from feast to feast. We all have experienced Passover at salvation, but some of us are still discovering the feast. There is much in Passover that a lot of people miss. I will give, in, give you seven reasons why we study the subject. Number one, because the feast reveal the Lord. He is hidden in the feast. You have to dig it out. Number two, they are present truths that the Holy Spirit uses to quicken you in your walk. Number three, in them we hear what God is saying today. Number four, they reveal what things are to come. They reveal shadows to come. And number five, we are able to understand prophetic types as we see them and then see the substance. We will understand the type and then the substance. Number six, the feast increases our knowledge of the Lord himself. You receive the knowledge of the Lord more clearly as we study, as you'll see tonight. And number seven, the feast reveal heavenly things. So seven things why we should study the feast. What is so important about the feast? If you want to know the Lord, you have to know the word. And on the early, and the early church discovered the Jewish Messiah through the shadows, types, and through the feast and sacrifices in the Old Testament. None of them had the gospel for nearly a hundred years. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Moses understood 
so did Joshua, but no one, barely anyone else understood. So we must understand that as you read the Old Testament, you begin to swim, swim in deeper waters, and you begin to understand deeper things so your feet are on solid ground. So when the trials come, you will not be knocked out. When you look at the first feast, Passover, you have to understand that the Passover has three feasts in it. So we are going to break them in three. The first feast is called Passover, but in Passover also includes unleavened bread. And the feast of sheaths or fruits, so you have to see them as one feast divided into three. The second headline feast uh, is the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. That is the second major feast. The third feast is called Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets includes Atonement and Tabernacle. They are called Passover Weeks and Trumpets, yet they include all and seven and all seven in the three. Is that clear? Tonight we are presenting only Passover. That is all we have time for. So Passover is Leviticus 23 from verse 4 all the way to verse 14. The first feast Passover, which includes unleavened bread and first fruits, took place on the first month when they came out of Egypt. It is important to understand that the first month in your own experience is your salvation when you accepted the Lord. When you get saved, whether it is February, June, or July, that is your beginning. And in your beginning, God will reveal what I'm going to show you. So you may still be in your beginning for a long time. You have to get through your beginning to work into your second season. So your beginning is Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits. Every Christian and believer, Jew or Gentile, must experience the first feast called Passover, which includes unleavened bread and first fruits. In Israel, these feasts were observed. In the Messiah, they are fulfilled. In your life, they are applied. You have to apply them, because if you don't apply them, your walk with the Lord will be incomplete. So the first Passover, let's talk about the first part of it. The first part is mentioned in Exodus 12, beginning at verse 1 through 14. We have to realize something very powerful. In this feast, God is declaring the gospel to Israel. In the Bible, it makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that Yeshua, Messiah, is our Passover lamb. The Lord began to declare the gospel in this in such detail in the Old Testament that it is amazing. Now let me just explain what Passover means. The Hebrew word is Pesach. It means to pass over, to be protected, and it also means to be delivered. Now I want to show you 21 revelations filled on the cross that God was declaring. The gospel in Exodus 12, Moses saw it, Joshua saw it, but very few saw it, but the rest were blinded. The details are astonishing. In chapter 12, verse 2, the Lord says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. What does that mean to you? It means in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I am a new creation. This is the beginning of my life forever. Eternity in the believer's life begins at Passover. Your spiritual journey begins at Passover. I begin my life eternally with God at Passover. I am already in, in eternity. Passover begins my eternal life. I will not die. I live eternally. I am already living eternally. Eternity begins with Passover. It doesn't begin with death. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Everything is passed away and everything is like new. As you see, this corresponds to the uh, 
to the verses I gave you in the Old Testament. It is prophecy. Now listen, you must hear this. Adam, in his unfallen state, was a child of God. You are not only a child of God, you are a begotten child of God. Big difference. James 1.18 says, We are living on a higher plateau than Adam ever did. We are a new creation. Adam was not a new creation. Adam was a child of God. We are begotten child of God. We are born again. Adam was not born again. I was born again. Adam wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. Adam did not experience salvation. We experience salvation. Do you understand? We celebrate Passover. You celebrate your Passover when you say you were saved. At that minute, your life eternally began. At that moment, you became a new creature in Christ Jesus, the Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. And that minute, moment, James 1.18 became a reality that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Can you see that? In the Old Testament, we were the first fruits in the feast. And now in the New Testament, it is fulfilled. We are the first fruits of creation. So when I look at the Old Testament and I look at the Feast of Israel and I begin to look at the details, I get quite amazed. And here's why. The Bible tells me from verse 3 on in Exodus 12, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to, to themselves every man a lamb. When I read that, God commands Israel to take a lamb in on the tenth day and is telling them to put that lamb aside until the fourteenth day, ordained to die in due time, and one begins to wonder and whether Israel ever understood why. So God says, take the lamb on the tenth day and keep it for four days, and on the fourteenth day you will kill it at evening. We read it in the New Testament that Yeshua, the Lamb of God, our Messiah, entered Jerusalem on the tenth day and was slain on the fourteenth day in fulfillment of Exodus 12, 3. He fulfilled being the Passover lamb. The Jews observed the Passover, not really realizing that when they observed the Passover on the 10th day, it was fulfilled when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. The Lord gave his life on the 14th day because it says, speak to the children of Israel in the 10th day of this month, you shall take every man a lamb. And then he goes on to say, if the house be too little and so on. But verse six says, you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. The whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. And then, as I said, on the 14th day of the same month, the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evening. Now, it is amazing that that is exactly what happened. And Yeshua fulfills it in detail. So here, here we see the first and the second prophecy fulfilled. The first prophecy of the 21 prophecies fulfilled. The first one is that we will be the beginning of months to you. The work of the cross begins your life. The second prophecy is fulfilled when Yeshua walks into Jerusalem on the 10th day and gives his life on the 14th day, basically laid aside four days. Four days, the lamb had to be laid aside for four days because the Bible from Adam to Yeshua is exactly 4,000 years. So we see Jesus being laid aside for 4,000 years. Adam was introduced and 4,000 years later, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, dies on the cross. Second Peter 3.8 makes it very clear. And the psalmist in Psalm 90, verse 4, makes it very clear. But first, I want to read First Peter. So in Second Peter, verse 8, he says something quite remarkable. 
Beloved, be not ignorant that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So here we see the Lord being put aside for 4,000 years after the creation of Adam, and then dies on the cross 4,000 years later. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah, the Passover lamb, comes into Jerusalem on the 10th day and is crucified on the 14th day. The third prophecy fulfilled when the Lord says in Exodus chapter 12 verses 5 is something quite amazing. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a man of the first year. Ye shall take it out. And now let me read to you from the Old Testament, Leviticus. These are the feast. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, there are, these are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. The Sabbath, there are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. You are not to do any work, for whenever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. The Passover and unleavened bread, these are the appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at the appointed times. Now listen to you here, the Lord prophesied to precisely in these passages. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. The number 14 is important. Numbers are important to the Lord. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. Unleavened throughout the Old and New Testament is a symbol for sin. The land, for seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, pre present an offering made to the Lord by fire. First fruits, speak to Israel and say to them, when you enter the land, I'm going to give you and reap a harvest. Bring to the priest a sheaf the first grain you harvest. We are his sheaf, his first fruits. He is to weigh the sheaf before the Lord and it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to weigh it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you weigh the sheaf, you must sacrifice a lamb, a year old without defect. Who is the lamb? The Messiah, the Passover lamb. The fact he had no sin, he was perfect. Together with its grain offering of two tenths of an epa of the fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made to the Lord by fire, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter of a hin of wine, you must not eat any bread or roast any new grain until the very day you bring this offering to the Lord. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations. Why weren't we allowed to have ye yeast on seven days of Passover? It was a symbol that we were to be without, we will be without sin. When we accept the Lord, our sins are forgiven. The Feast of Weeks. From the day after the Sabbath and the day you brought the sheath of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain. The number 50, you'll see how it fits in. From whenever you live, bring two loaves made of two tenths of the fine flour baked with yeast as a way of offerings of first fruits to the Lord. We are his first fruits, as it says in Corinthians. Present with this bread seven male lambs, each a year old and without defect. One young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to God. And it says in the New Testament that believers are a sweet aroma to the Lord.
Then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs, each a year old, for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering, together with the bread of the first fruits. They are a sacred offering to the Lord. And the same day you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come when you live. And it's interesting to note when you go to Israel, the whole year is built around seven feasts. It's not just the Christmas Thanksgiving, but it revolves around seven major feasts. And it's a great joy. And uh, it's the, the rhythm, the heartbeat of Jerusalem. Your land do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And we see that today with the food shelters all around, with Master's Manna, with Cheshire's food. We give our, our leftovers to the poor. This is the law of gleaning. The Feast of Trumpets. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, on the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a day of rest, a sacred assembly commemorating with trumpet blasts. Do not regular work or present an offering made to the Lord by fire. The trumpet blast will be the second coming. This is prophetic and it's the only feast that hasn't been pro prophetically fulfilled. The Day of Atonement. The Lord said to Moses, the 10th of the seventh month is a day of atonement. Hold a second assembly and deny yourself and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do no work on that day because it is a day of atonement when atonement was made for you before the Lord your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on that day must be cut off from his people. I will destroy from among his people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work on that day. This is to be a lasting covenant from generation to generation, wherever you live. It is a Sabbath of rest for you, and you must deny yourselves from the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening you are to observe the Sabbath. The Feast of Tabernacles, I will finish up. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's Feast of Tabernacle begins, and it lasts for seven days. The first day is a sacred assembly. Do no work. For seven days, presented offerings made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. These are the Lord's appointed feast, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies for bringing offerings made to the Lord by fire, the burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings required for each day. These offerings are in addition to those for the Lord's Sabbaths, in addition to your gifts and whatever you have vowed and all the free will of offerings you have to the Lord. So beginning with the 15th day of the seventh month, after you have gathered the crops of the land, celebrated the festival to the Lord for seven days. The first day is a day of rest, and on the eighth day also is a day on rest. On the first day, you are to take choice fruits from the tree and palms and leafy branches and poplars and rejoice before the Lord, your God, for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days. This is to be a lasting ordinance uh, to the Lord for generations to come. Live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought you out of Israel. So Moses announced to the Israelites the appointed feast of Israel. Thank you and have a good evening.